Welcome everyone to the Wound Healing Society presents the Chronicles of Wound Scene Investigation webinar series. Today we'll be covering venous leg ulcers, uh, excuse me, uh, inflammatory ulcers, swollen legs, itch, and gout. Our speakers today are Ramana Aslam and, and sitting, uh, sitting in for Dot Wire is Lee Rotsi. Uh, Rumana, please introduce uh, yourself. Harvey, I'll start. Thank you. I'll start the meeting. Um, oh, I'm sorry. So, I, thank I you got all. So excited. Uh, I know <laughs> uh, for attending the second series of the, of the Chronicles of Wound Scene Investigations webinars. Uh, please note that if you have any questions throughout this evening's presentation, use the Q&A box and we'll address as many questions as possible at the end of the webinar. And as a reminder, this webinar is being recorded. So um, I am Kath Berge, I am the, the chair of the Wound Healing Society Education Committee at present um, and sort of the um, try to organise this, but obviously Harvey does a much better job. Um, and Harvey will in, carry on now. <laughs> I'm Harvey Hemmel. I'm the, a wound doctor at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. I'll be moderating today and helping to uh, address any questions that come up from the audience. Uh, the first speaker will be Lee Razzi, and we'll start, uh, start by introducing Ramana Aslam. Oh, am I going next? Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm very glad to be here. Um, I am Romana Aslam. I am uh, the Chief of Physical Medicine and Rehab at Yale University and also Director of uh, Wound Center with Yale New Haven Health. Now I pass it on to our first speaker, Dr. Lee Ritzi, who's uh, sitting in for Dr. Weir, uh, but I think he'll do as good a job, hopefully. Okay. <laughs> you go ahead, Lee. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for uh, being with us, and it's a privilege to be here with you. Uh, yes, uh, Dot unfortunately had a, uh, a conflict that came up and asked me to uh, sub for her. Um, Dot and I were both part of the original cast of characters here uh, on uh, Wound Scene Investigation back uh, in this session at SAWC in uh, 2018. Uh, I'm the medical director for the Center for Wound Healing and Hyperbaric Medicine at Saratoga Hospital in Saratoga Springs in upstate New York. And um, let's get started. All right, next slide, Ramana, please. Okay, so we're gonna start uh, tonight by uh, talking a little bit about uh, pyoderma gangrenosa. Certainly considered one of the atypicals, but in my experience, uh, probably the most typical of the atypicals. Uh, PG is an uncommon ulcerative cutaneous condition of uncertain etiology, um, but there are a couple of uh, important associations. Pyoderma gangrenosum is commonly associated with uh, a certain underlying clinical disorders. And the most common of those are the inflammatory bowel diseases, uh, ulcerative colitis, and Crohn's disease. Uh, further differential infection, malignancy, vasculitis, collagen vascular diseases. Um, ulcerations commonly uh, occur spontaneously in those predisposed uh, to pyoderma, but also surgical dehiscence can masquerade as pyoderma or vice versa uh, due to the surgical uh, uh, wounding. We know that PG is uh, um, a dysregulation of the immune system. So then we'll see that we uh, use some immune suppressants from time to time for the treatment of pyoderma. Next slide. We really need to employ a multimodal approach for PG. Uh, the, the ulcers are fragile, if you will, and uh, one of the important things to understand about pyoderma gangrenosum is that it possesses the property of pathergy, which means that if the ulcer 
is sharply debrided or mechanically traumatized in any other way, it will grow larger. That is the process of uh, uh, pathogen. So you see in the two photos to the right, uh, the, the uh, original wounds in the left-hand photo were debrided and 10 days later, they were significantly larger. So treatment of pyoderma involves anti-inflammatory agents, usually uh, systemic as well as topical, including antibiotics, systemic corticosteroids, such as prednisone, immunosuppressive agents, uh, such as uh, uh, infliximab, adalimumab, uh, uh, dapsone, and sometimes uh, cyclosporin. Uh, a couple of tricks for the application of topical steroids are crushed prednisone tablets sprinkled into the wound bed, uh, as well as uh, asthma in a steroid containing asthma inhalers, and then topical tac tacrolimus. If debridement is necessary, it should be done only after treatment is in place. Next slide. Peristomal pyoderma is really a, uh, a, a tough problem. So commonly we will see this in, in patients who have had colostomy or ileostomy due to Crohn's disease or uh, ulcerative colitis. Um, exact incidence and prevalence uh, of this is unknown. I would say in our clinical practice here, uh, we, we probably see two or three per year. Uh, management of the condition is difficult, uh, really requires the gastroenterologist, the, the, the surgeon. Uh, very important is to have a good uh, um, enterostomal therapist or WOCN nurse uh, on board with all the tricks of the trade in terms of uh, pouching and appliances. These lesions tend to begin as small erythematous papules that, that spread concentrically and then coalesce to form a larger uh, ulceration. Mature lesions tend to have sort of a purplish violaceous border. They're quite painful. Next slide. So uh, in the early post-op period, these ulcers can be caused by abscess, uh, infected hematomas, or mucocutaneous uh, uh, separation of the, um, uh, of the stoma. Late after surgery, uh, they can be due to recurrent inflammatory bowel disease, enterocutaneous fistulas, faceplate pressure, uh, trauma, and then PG, of course, the topic of, uh, of this. Next. So anatomically, the peristomal skin is the skin right around the stoma. And importantly, it's the skin that the ostomy wafer adheres to. So sometimes that wafer uh, can even uh, um, be the inciting factor that, uh, that leads to the pyoderma gangrenosum. They're, they're usually quite chronic and Ill, indolent, but they also can occur fairly quickly and acutely. So how do we, how do we pouch the ostomy uh, when there is a peristomal pyoderma gangrenosum? Uh, call your favorite WOCN is, uh, is certainly my answer to that. Next slide. So this is uh, case number one is a 68 year old female. This is a patient of uh, Dr. Lisa Gould, uh, who was uh, also part of this panel back in 2018. Previously healthy lady had a colostomy for diverticulitis in April of 2017, developed purple discoloration around the area followed by ulceration in June of 2017. This was exquisitely painful and enlarging. So that is uh, the photo. So of course we know what the diagnosis is. Um, next slide. So, um, this lady was started on a tapering course of oral prednisone uh, as well as topical tacrolimus. Uh, tacrolimus uh, was initially twice daily, um, and in September of uh, uh, in September the prednisone taper begun uh, began, and then in October, October twenty third, the tacrolimus was decreased to daily when the wound really was starting to uh, improve, as you can see in the photo. Next slide. 
In November, then, she developed increased pain, new open wounds, and the tacrolimus was increased back up to twice daily. Um, interestingly, she had a dental procedure and then based on or following that, noticed increased pain, new open wounds, prednisone uh, started again at 50 milligrams a day and tacrolimus twice daily. You know, the, the question whether the dental procedure had anything uh, to do with it. November 17th, the area was improved, tacrolimus back to once daily. Uh, January 26th, once daily tacrolimus, things are looking pretty good. Next slide. And uh, prednisone was tapered uh, in February and in March, she is off prednisone, no flare up. The area looks very nice and she does have a peristomal hernia. So what's the risk of recurrence here? Um, hard to say in that the original surgery was for diverticulitis, not for Crohn's disease or uh, ulcerative colitis. However, uh, a, an individual who has had a pyoderma gangrenosum certainly is at risk for further recurrences. Should she have the ostomy reversed? Um, what kind of complications might she have with the surgical incisions if she has it uh, reversed. And the cause of the hernia uh, typically with these is uh, 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 a separation of the, uh, uh, of the muscle layers. And sometimes uh, if the ostomy uh, is, uh, is created a little bit larger than it needs to be, that can lead to the herniation as well. Next slide. Case number two, uh, this, is, uh, this is a case of, uh, that uh, uh, Dot and I took care of back in, in Buffalo a few years ago, 75 year old guy in 2014 had a total colectomy with a proctectomy and ileostomy for ulcerative colitis. He had no difficulties until about a month before he came to see us uh, when the area began to get irritated, then ulcerated. And uh, this was uh, what we saw on October 31st. Next slide, please. We started him initially on a 16-day tapering course of oral ed, uh, prednisone plus uh, uh, topically crushed one milligram tablets of prednisone sprinkled onto the wound with each appliance change covered with calcium alginate and then the wafer. So uh, we found that the wafer started to melt down into the area. So we did add a thin hydrocolloid over. Next slide. November 14th, he's a little bit better. November 22nd, he is a little bit better yet. Next slide. Uh, December 19th, you see what we have. January 23rd and March 25th, uh, he is essentially closed. And that is what uh, the, the wafer looks like, uh, that uh, dot designed to go around uh, this area at the end. Next slide, please. So this was really a tough case. Again, this one uh, back in Buffalo that I shared with one of our other uh, walk nurses uh, there. Past medical history, Crohn's disease had a bowel perforation with a total colectomy and ileostomy. Uh, she presented to us with a four month history of erosion and ulceration in the peristomal area. Now, historically, interestingly, she had recently been to Roswell Park, the Regional Cancer Center in Buffalo for resection of a malignant mel uh, melanoma. That will become important as we move along here. So we presumed this to be pyoderma. Next slide. We started her uh, again 
on a tapering dose, uh, tapering course of prednisone, starting with 60 milligrams a day for three days and then 50 milligrams a day for three days, so on and so forth. Initially used a poly uh, polyvinyl alcohol pigmented foam dressing around the area. This is what she looked like three days after the initial presentation. And this was in June of 2012. So in three months, she's starting to clear up, but the deeper ulcerations remained. We changed her to a silver alginate underneath the wafer. Next slide. And uh, uh, in three months, we're still struggling. Uh, we started her on enzymatic debridement with collagenase covered with an alginate under the appliance. And we were unable to resume her steroid therapy um, due to the risk of melanoma recurrence with steroid therapy. So this was in concert with her folks at Roswell, and they recommended against a second course of prednisone. Next. Four weeks later, she is much better. Uh, with uh, that uh, a change to the silver alginate under the wafer. Next slide. And uh, we then referred her back to the dermatology department at Roswell. And uh, reportedly from Roswell over the next couple of years, she did quite well without any recurrences of the peristomal pyoderma. Next slide. Case four, this is the last pyoderma case, I believe. 56-year-old lady with a history of ovarian cancer had been diagnosed six years previously. She presented with a three-centimeter firm pink violaceous nodule with an ulceration uh, complaining of burning pain. Uh, unfortunately, biopsy of this showed a cutaneous metastasis secondary to her original ovarian cancer. Next slide. So cutaneous metastases um, refer, of course, to the growth of cancer cells in the skin originating from the original uh, visceral malignancy. Skin metastases fairly rare in the routine clinical practice of uh, dermatology, but of really major significance uh, because they usually indicate the presence of advanced disease. And this might be the first uh, indication that we see of metastatic spread of an internal malignancy. Next slide. Okay, and last for me here is the infamous red, heavy, itchy, scaly, painful legs that we all see so much of with chronic venous insufficiency with or without ulceration and lymphedema. Next slide. So some folks are unfortunate enough to have it all. The scaling, the itching, the erythema, the crusting, the, the sort of woody edema. This, this is a, uh, a really advanced but classic case of chronic venous stasis dermatitis secondary to the underlying inflammatory process of chronic venous insufficiency with ulceration. Next slide. Lots of blee, not bling, but blee, bilateral lower extremity erythema and edema. So 78-year-old nursing home resident complained of a burning sensation, uh, afebrile, normal laboratory studies, no constitutional signs uh, of illness. You're called to recommend an antibiotic. Does she need an antibiotic? Next slide. Not all red legs are due to cellulitis. And, you know, um, there was a study that showed that chronic venous insufficiency ulcerations cost about $15,000 per episode to treat. That cost doubles if folks are hospitalized with their venous disease. And the most common reason for hospitalization of a patient with chronic venous insufficiency is the diagnosis of cellulitis. So not all red legs are due to cellulitis. Next slide. So cellulitis tends uh, uh, to, to be 
bilateral, well, first of all, it tends to be unilateral. If it's bilateral, it is asymmetric. It tends to be red, hot, and warm. And what did all three of these patients have in common? They had an elevated white blood count. They had fever and chills. In other words, they were sick with this lower leg uh, erythema. Next slide. Next slide, please. I'm trying to do it. Hold on. No idea what happened. Let's see. Oops. I'm going to go like this because that's. Ah, there. Oh, uh, back one. There we go. There we go. Yeah. So uh, what we were missing uh, was was the word cellulitis. Sorry, that was a that was a fly in. So uh, these Sorry. are I'm trying to correct this thing for you. Okay. These are cellulitis. Um, red hot legs accompanying leukocytosis, fever, and chills. Next slide. And here is cellulite isn't uh, bilaterally symmetric well-demarcated erythema in the absence of any constitutional signs or symptoms, no elevated white count, no fever or chills. So it's an opportunity for us to educate our colleagues that there is an erythema that accompanies chronic venous insufficiency and the associated inflammatory process. Next slide. So, pink versus red, bilateral versus unilateral, typically chronic venous insufficiency, unless it's related to deep venous thrombosis, is a bilateral phenomenon um, and uh, uh, tends to be more, uh, more pink than the bright red of cellulitis. Next slide. 68-year-old, greater than 10-year history of leg swelling, it increased after a long trip in the car. She went to see her provider and was placed on levofloxacin with minimal improvement, complained of weeping, itching, pain, and heaviness. What's your diagnosis here? We look at bilateral, bilaterally, symmetrically edematous, scaly, mildly erythematous legs. She did not need levofloxacin. She needs compression, calf muscle exercise, and elevation of the lower legs. Next slide. And I will now pass this over to Dr. Aslam uh, to talk with us about uh, lymphedema, the glycocalyx, and uh, finishing out with tophaceous gout. Um, thanks, everybody. Thank you, Lee. So let's uh, switch to lymphedema. Uh, lymphedema is caused by failure to drain protein-rich interstitial fluid. And chronic lymph stasis has numerous consequences which are listed here, but fibrosis and inflammation are the key players that cause all the changes that you see in legs with lymphedema. It is affected it affects mostly women more than men and adults, legs more than arms. It has a characteristic skin appearance. It involves feet and toes. It is firm edema and uh, almost, um, uh, almost always would have some chronic infection and then can give rise to acute cellulitis also. There are mainly three stages. The first picture you see is stage one, where with leg elevation, the edema can recede. Stage two, where with leg elevation, the edema does not recede and is pitting edema and is brawny and hard. And the third picture is stage three, which is elephantiasis with all the characteristics that you see in this picture. The management is multimodal and multidisciplinary um, based on physical therapy. Physical therapists do decongestive therapy with manual lymph drainage, 
and multiple layers of compression bandages for sustained compression. There is, of course, the most important thing is weight loss because without weight loss, none of the other treatments will be very successful. There's medications and surgical excision and lymphatic microsurgery. However, for surgery to be successful, the BMI needs to be below 35, which in most cases it is not, as you all know. So weight loss is very important, education of the patient for any compression therapy to be successful. Compression is very important in lymphedema. You see this one leg where there was no compression, the, leg, the other leg that shows lymphedema very controlled. Uh, is after compression, external compression therapy. It is not only important to manage lymphedema, but also uh, heals ulcers that are secondary to lymphedema. So compression is both for reduction of edema as well as healing of ulcers. Now we will go to this slide, which I believe, Lee, is your case. If you want to um, talk about this one, please. Sure. So this uh, uh, this was a um, oh sorry sorry there we go. Uh, this was a fifty year old man uh, who came to uh, see us uh, in the clinic in Buffalo, and what you see lying uh, between his right thigh and left calf is a huge lymphedematous panis. This whole thing was nearly rock hard, and he had this open wound at the at 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 the distal end of this. Uh, we did transcutaneous oximetry, and that area was really hypoxic. Uh, really wasn't getting any blood flow at all. This specimen, he he had to stand and swing it a couple of times before he could get it up on the gurney so that we could examine him. Um, anyway, uh, the story had a very happy ending. Uh, the, one of the plastic surgeons that I worked with uh, in Buffalo took him to the OR and resected this panis. The surgical specimen weighed 55 pounds. And, uh, but uh, a patient had a beautiful recovery and was absolutely thrilled. So uh, that's that story. Thank you, Lee. And I have to say that lymph lymphatic surgery is successful in cases like this, as well as um, uh, hereditary lymphedema that may affect one leg and it's not really related to obesity. Thank you, Lee. So now we'll switch gears to a little bit of pathophysiology. So. When you see these legs that we see very commonly in our womb centers that are edematous, swollen, red, scaly skin, uh, oozing fluid, itching, um, what is really happening uh, in the tissues? Why does this happen? So let me just first talk about something called the glycocalyx. Glycocalyx is a network of multiple complexes that line the inside of the vessel. So here you see the endothelial cells, which are the lining of the vessel. There's a vessel wall and the glycocalyx is the lining inside. It regulates vascular permeability and a host of other functions to maintain homeostasis. You see that this is a layer, this feathery layer inside the lumen of a vessel that is uh, the glycocalyx. It, is, it performs very dynamic functions where constituents are cons constantly being added to it or removed from it and maintains an equilibrium between the elements of blood uh, as well as the endothelial uh, wall. It, it forms a very slippery, slimy surface. If you've ever held a fish, you know how slimy the skin is. That's actually a glycocalyx. It helps the fish regulate their uh, fluid uh, inside the bodies and also optimizes their movement in different um, environments of fluid. Uh, similarly, it provides this smooth, slimy surface inside our vessels. It allows red blood cells, which are shown here, the red blood cells. Um, it optimizes the movement of the cells in the vessel and forms like an exclusion zone so these, these blood, red blood cells do not adhere to the vessel wall, almost like the nonstick coating of a frying pan. Um, 
then when it is intact as shown in the picture above, um, it really uh, performs many different functions, including the fluid balance, keeping the fluid in or out, depending on the physiological need. It also detects stress in the vessel wall and modulates vascular tone. It repulses RBCs as shown above. It also prevents adhesiveness of platelets and leukocytes. It also traps enzymes that break down harmful oxygen species, so it reduces oxidative stress. Now in the picture on the lower side, when it is disrupted or damaged, then there is flow of water and macromolecules outside of the vessel into the tissues. The leukocytes start adhering to the vessel wall, which is the start of inflammation. And the platelets also, also start adhering to the vessel wall, forming clots. Factors that threaten or degrade the glycocalyx are ischemia, inflammation, trauma, atherosclerosis, hyperglycemia of diabetes, and intravenous fluid mismanagement, including uh, hypervolemia. This uh, paper by Harvey and Nell discusses the link between lymphatic vessels and lipids. There is a link between lymphatic function and adipose or fat biology. As you see in this picture, uh, there is the top layer epidermis and in the dermis, there are lymphatic vessels which are in close proximity to adipose tissue or fat cells. The lymphatic vessels transport and absorb lipids. They also regulate the traffic of immune cells. The adipose tissue is in close proximity because it is the energy reservoir to provide fuel for this uh, immune cell trafficking and immune responses. Um, this is a proposed model for adipose tissue expansion initiated by lymph vascular dysfunction. In leakage of lymph from ruptured lymphatic vessels, there is an increase in adipose tissue mass. That is due to exposure of the adipose tissue to lymph-derived adipogenic signals. There are two processes. One of them is actually hypertrophy of the adipose sites or fat cells, which is because of these adipogenic signals, but there is also increase in number of the fat cells or adipocytes, which is driven by chronic inflammation. This is a paper by Alziuski who uh, measured uh, concentration of different molecules in obstructive lymphedema. Lymphedema accumulates, is accumulation of water, proteins, and many cellular elements. Um, so he compared the levels of the cellular elements and proteins in lymph, lymph, uh, lymph fluid from uh, patients with lymphedema and compared them with normal healthy volunteers. So the gray bars are lymphedema and the black bars are normal. Um, his results showed that there are protein concentrations that will increase in uh, obstructive lymphedema, especially when there is no, um, no give or no uh, expansion uh, permitted in the tissues. They are fibrosed um, and are stuck with cooling of uh, lymphatic fluid. And that is when there is increase in lymphatic, in lymph protein concentrations the concentrations of cytokines as well as chemokines are also elevated in obstructive lymphedema. Cytokines and chemokines are proteins uh, that, um, that regulate immune responses. So basically it means that um, in obstructive lymphedema, uh, there is uh, intense inflammation that prevails in, as a chronic inflammatory process in lymph stasis. What about diuretics? Diuretics are contraindicated in patients with lymphedema and edema, especially if that is the only reason they are being given diuretics. What diuretics will do is it will merely increase the concentration of the proteins and the macromolecules discussed above in the interstitial spaces, 
and will uh, drive more inflammation, which will lead to irreversible skin and soft tissue changes that I will discuss in the um, uh, next few slides, and also increases the risk of cellulitis. In um, when lymph stasis is present, any bacteria that uh, gain access to the tissues will thrive in that static fluid. As we all know, stasis will drive bacterial uh, multiplication and infection. So giving diuretics actually increases the risk of cellulitis. So they are contraindicated when the sole uh, reason for the diuretics is lymphedema. Many patients will come to our center and I'm sure to all of you will say, my leg is leaking or my leg is crying. What is happening here? It is a phenomena called lymphorrhea, which I will explain. But I will show you this case. Um, this is a 78 year old, has had stasis dermatitis, has had chronic venous insufficiency, has a non-healing ulcer, which by biopsy is squamous cell cancer. What is lymphorrhea? Lymphorrhea is an abnormal flow of lymph that drains externally from disrupted lymphatic vessels, but interestingly can also be retained within a wound. So when there is a surgical dissection and inadequate closure of lymphatic vessels after surgery, it is an uncommon but potentially serious complication. And it can lead to um, other complications as well as infections and the treatment is not currently standardized. In this case, uh, the, there was excision and grafting and the graft was secured by negative pressure and a compression uh, therapy was started. Um, it took a while, about a week, to stop the massive outpouring of the clear fluid, um, but there was still fluid when you pressed uh, on the tissues or in the peri wound area. This was treated with topical collagen and it took about six weeks of this therapy um, with compression wraps to resolve the edema and the lymphorrhea. However, it was still noted that there is still subcutaneous edema on palpation. So which just means that even after uh, the initial lymphorrhea is treated, there, there has to be ongoing uh, compression to maintain, um, the, maintain the leg without edema and lymphorrhea because it reoccurs very commonly. These are some additional resources to learn more about lymphedema. I think now we switch gears to itch. So we see that very commonly in patients with venous insufficiency and edema that come to our centers. So here I will talk about this pathway that is um, basically explains the chronic and recalcitrant itch that is mediated via histamine independent pathways. So that is why antihistamines do not work in this chronic itch. Basically, um, you know how we have hyperkeratosis. Whenever we see hyperkeratosis, this pathway, although not completely understood, but this uh, paper explains uh, a proposed pathway where hyperkeratosis is accompanied by increased level of proteases as well as protease activated receptors or PAR2. PAR2 is a mediator of intense itch. And the way it mediates, it mediates itch is by activating sensory nerves to cause neuroinflammation. So this itch underlying mechanism is neuroinflammation, sprouting of nerves, causing hypersensitivity of skin. And this pathway, as I said before, is independent of histamines. And so very difficult to treat. Stasis dermatitis, these legs show stasis dermatitis. Uh, the pictures above show scaly skin. Uh, the pictures below where the, that skin has been treated, which I'll show in the following slides, um, is a much better appear of, appearance of uh, the skin. So stasis dermatitis is an inflammatory dermatosis. As you can see, the, everything here relates to an inflammatory process. This commonly affects its extremities. It is really very common to see in chronic venous insufficiency. In chronic venous insufficiency, there is venous hypertension. 
what, what does we mean as hypertension do? Of course, the clinical features you see listed here, there is erythema, scaling, weeping, crusting, hyperpigmentation. But what is happening in a venous hypertension is leakage of inflammatory cells or accumulation of inflammatory cells in the tissues, as well as leakage of red blood cells where the hemoglobin is disrupted and the iron leaks out of the hemoglobin and stains the hyperpigmentation that you see, it is a stain, which is called hemosiderin. So hemosiderin and all these inflammatory cells, they activate the macrophages to produce something called IL-31. IL-31 is a very strong mediator of itch. And it also acts through um, the, the neuroinflammation pathway and not through histamine. So one of the proposed pathways of itch that is again chronic and difficult to treat. Thick hyperkeratotic skin needs to be treated. Uh, you see how the picture, um, the first picture shows hyperkeratotic skin and the second one where it has been removed. And it needs to be removed just because of all the mediators that I talked about in the slides before this, how this is inflammatory, how this is uh, causing uh, more inflammation and more itching. Uh, and also in these cracks and, and nooks and crannies that you see in, uh, inside these scales, um, bacteria love to hide and can cause increased bacterial colonization and risk of infection. Um, there are many different ways to remove it, but often, uh, and this, this, this case um, uh, was Dot Rears, and she said all of these were done in one visit. It is very important to start it on, on the initial visit to get rid of the skin because any therapies you do or contact layers or um, topicals will not uh, really be effective if you don't remove that. And sometimes removing this will uncover some ulcers that are not very visible. So one of the ways to do it is to do moist, uh, moist therapy, uh, wrapping the leg uh, with uh, a chucks. Um, uh, this one was soaked in hypochlorous acid. Uh, it's a start, you see a difference. This was all in one visit after moistening the leg with hypochlorous acid and then um, loosely scraping uh, some of the dead layers of skin. You can use a tongue blade. In our center, the nurses use the paper ruler very effectively um, and either um, some uh, methods of debridement that are not aggressive, uh, they can be used. This is another before and after. Um, and really uh, decreases the inflammatory dermatitis. Again, before and after, you can see how you see the wounds more clearly now. These are better, easier to measure and monitor progress. Same uh, before and after. Uh, this is an example uh, showing progression of how removal of this um, weepy, crusted skin uh, improves wound healing. Um, and sometimes you have to do it uh, multiple times and continue to keep the skin in a healthy, um, non-crusted state. And we can use some uh, less aggressive methods of debridement. Uh, and it can improve over time. Sometimes it takes many visits to improve it. Uh, compression and good skin care is the mainstay of treating these edematous legs. And I did say that a lot of processes of inflammation will lead to the buildup of the scaly um, hyperkeratotic uh, necrotic skin. Um, but oftentimes, honestly, it is because the patient, on top of all of that inflammation, do not wash their legs. So it is accumulation of dead skin because the leg has not been washed, which is very, very common. The first thing you teach them is they need to be the legs need to be washed and cleaned just like the rest of their body. Another example of uh, a good skin care and, and wound care where um, all that um, edge has been refreshed and uh, the hypergranulation treated with silver nitrate and just one week after the wound and the peri wound area are looking much more healthier. All right, this is a special appearance for today with uh, uric acid and relationship to chronic ulcer and other subcutaneous ulcers. Uh, uric acid is associated with situations of increased oxidative stress. 
It plays an important role in persistent inflammatory processes. Chronic leg ulcers are, of course, um, uh, areas where there is uh, chronic inflammation. And Fernandez et al. demonstrated that uric acid levels were high in wound fluids of patients with leg ulcers. And it is proportion, the concentration is proportional to ulcer severity. Now, another um, disease of uh, high uric acid levels is gout, which is an inflammatory arthritis characterized by hyperuricemia. And some, another process happens in patients with gout is um, you see this white material. Now, what is this white material? This white material is actually precipitation of monosodium butyrate crystals, which are seen commonly in inflammatory arthritis, which is gout. But these are crystals which are subcutaneous and usually affect areas like the helix of the ear and other joints, commonly the first MTP joint, uh, elbows, less commonly other uh, joints, wrists, elbows, wrists, knees, and ankles. But I have had patients with lymphedema and these um, tophaceous gout or called tophi, which are precipitation of the urate crystals present in subcutaneous tissue of the leg. So when I did compression, I was also trying to compress these nodules. So what is tophaceous gout? Uh, those were seen in the pictures. Those were images of tophi or tophaceous gout. Um, in patients who present early with tophaceous gout, usually it's a late presentation of patients with gout, but sometimes with patients who have reduced creatinine clearance, they can have more symptomatic disease early. It affects about 12 to 35% of those with gout. And usually they have very high serum urate, le urate levels, which average about 11 versus uh, less than 10 uh, in those without TOFI. Especially a challenging case is when you have ulcers uh, on top of tophaceous gout, when the, these crystals break through the skin. This is a case of uh, such an ulcer on the foot, um, and these can also get infected. So what is, uh, the, these are rare ulcers, and so there is not really any standard treatment uh, but this was an ex experience of one of the original panelists of the uh, wound scene investigation, where um, you do treat uh, for uric acid and you uh, uh, decrease the level of uric acid with uricose uric agents and order other medications with dietary modifications as well. But what do you do for the ulcer? You do try to treat the ulcer with, with standard wound care, but definitely to treat infection more important is to uh, look at the joint underneath and the bone to rule out any infection of the bone or septic arthritis. You do treat the infection if infection is present. Um, this was treated with episodic debridement to remove that trophaceous material. Now the debridement uh, should, um, it's in some papers I've read, it should not be very aggressive because these are very hard wounds to, uh, hard to heal wounds, uh, but certainly have to remove that tophaceous material. And again, the other standards, depending on where the wound is, uh, this was in the foot, so you do offloading. And as I said, you evaluate the bone and joints. This is our last slide. Um, so this is about ulcerated tophaceous gout. As I said, ulceration is rare and occurs when these crystals or tophi break through the skin. And often comorbidities that impair wound healing, such as diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, hypertension, are commonly noted in patients with ulcerated tophaceous gout, so it makes these ulcers even more challenging to heal. When ulceration does occur, arthrosynthesis of synovial fluid is necessary to rule out a secondary septic arthritis. As I said, because it is rare, there are no standard guidelines, but mostly the guideline is to do medical management to reduce the level of uric acid. Uh, the goal should be to go less than six um, and topical wound treatment should aim at preventing secondary infection and promote healing. Uh, there is surgical management when there is um, infection or 
they are so large that there is mechanical impairment of the joint, uncontrollable pain or cosmetic disfigurement, uh, then surgery is um, um, indicated. So that's uh, the end of this presentation. Uh, I thank you all very much for uh, staying with us. I think this is time for Harvey to um, start the Q&A or if there are any chats, questions in the chat. Let me stop share here. Let's see what we got for questions. Uh, Q&A, no open questions. Um. Yeah, I, I think that was a, a very thorough presentation from both of you. Um, Harvey, any questions that you can think of as a clinician? Because uh, we do have one. Would you? Okay. If you look on the Q and A, you'll, you'll see an open question from Macy. All right, very good. Do you obtain biopsies prior to treatment for PG? Oh, uh, that's a very important question. Lee, what do you say? Well, it, it, yes, and I think that uh, th there's there, <laughs> there's a couple of uh, interesting issues there. Uh, first of all, um, I there there really isn't a, um, a a real typical histologic picture of pyoderma gangrenosa. There are suggestive features, and the reports that I usually get uh, tell me that, uh, you know, here's what we see histologically. We see, you know, neutrophilic infiltrates and, and so on and so forth. Uh, in the proper clinical setting, uh, this may be pyoderma gangrenosum. Uh, so, you know, it's it's not, uh, you know, it's not like uh, this is uh, this is a pathognomonic histology for a particular type of malignancy. More, it tends to be a suggestive um, uh, report. Now, that said, uh, I think one of the things that I've learned is that whenever we're biopsying anything that is atypical, I think it's really important to send that specimen to a true dermatopathologist, uh, somebody who really looks at skin all day long. And remember, they're sitting in a room looking into a microscope. So we've got to give them a clue what it is that we're looking for. It's like sending a radiologist an x-ray report, uh, you know, I want a chest x-ray. Well, what are you looking for? Um, so same thing holds true. And yes, I do think that um, I think that obtaining a biopsy at this with a suspicion of pyoderma gangrenosum is uh, is really important. The question sometimes comes up: Well, uh, if you do a biopsy, is that going to create pathergy? And I and I think most folks um, believe that a five millimeter punch biopsy or a small excisional biopsy from the wound bed and the wound edge, uh, the benefit of that in getting the diagnosis outweighs the risk of pathogy. I will just add to that. I think that's very important, uh, Lee. And of course, in our experience, that small area of a biopsy does not really make it very worse. Um, I. I always uh, do a biopsy because when you have a strong clinical suspicion, it is really a diagnosis of exclusion, as you said. Right. And you get the biopsy back, which says non-specific inflammation. You know that <laughs> that is that is that is uh, pyoderma because of clinical. So you've actually ruled out anything else basically with the biopsy. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a clinical diagnosis. As long as you don't see a big bacterial infiltrate, you have to go with the clinical picture. Correct. The next question is, are the biologics better than steroids for PG? Lee, what's your first go-to? Uh, so my, my first go-to is prednisone. Uh, you know, in a tapering course, 
And I don't think there's really anything out there that tells you exactly how much you should give for how long. But, uh, you know, my, my recipe is an 18 day taper starting at 60 milligrams a day for three days and then going down 50, 40, 30, uh, uh, so on and so forth. And I think that um, pyoderma will initially respond to prednisone. Um, if that if that doesn't work, um, I and that that also is in concert with topical corticosteroids. Um, if that doesn't work, uh, I may try something like Dapsone. Uh, if I still don't have success, then I will uh, um, I'll enlist the help of my rheumatology colleagues because the the biologics such as Humira or you know, infliximab and adalimumab, I just feel that those are out of my wheelhouse. I, I don't have experience in using those and in following people. So I'm fortunate that I have, uh, I have a rheumatology colleague who is willing to, to uh, give me a hand and, and get people on Humira or one of the others uh, for that problem. And, and we really do see some nice success with those. All right, that's very good. Anything in your mind, Ramana, to augment that? Uh, no, I, I, same thing. Um, nothing else. That's a good answer. I think everybody's familiar with steroids, and I think they're more comfortable doing something that they're familiar with. I think that's a good point. All right, our next question is: What material or article do you suggest we provide to the PCP for support of not using diuretics for lymphedema? Uh, without cardiopulmonary complications. I think the, I'll tackle this one because it's, it's a pet peeve of mine. Diuretics are toxins to the kidney that are designed to dehydrate a patient who is suffering from a miscommunication between the heart and the kidney. If the heart is not propelling fast enough and hard enough, the kidney receptors are gonna say that we must be dehydrated. Let's hold on to liquid. In the case of lymphedema, there's a compartmentalization of fluid because of all the viscosity and other things that you talked about. So dehydrating the patient is not going to address the pathology. How would you, uh, Romana, what's your thought? Yeah, so I, th I think um, it all depends on the communication between the primary care physician and if they have a cardiologist. Um, it has to be a communication between the providers um, because sometimes, you know, if the lymphedema does not have that uh, that fibrosis and it's it's not compartmentalized, as you said, uh, and we are trying to compress it, uh, we want to make sure that the patient um, does not have any element of cardiac failure because once you start compression, that whole fluid, although you said it right, the diuretics are not doing anything for the leg edema. They may be treating the heart failure, but they are not doing anything for the leg edema. But in that case, a communication is important because if you compress all that fluid and the patient is not going to take their diuretic, it's going to overload the heart and give rise to pulmonary edema. So there's a fine line. Um, but when you talk to the provider and it is only to tra treat the leg edema, um, really, uh, you want to taper off uh, the diuretics uh, with their consent. And I think there was this question about education. I think education is provided uh, by the references that, uh, that are in this presentation, but also just to say to the primary, we are going to treat this with external compression. Um, and, uh, you know, um, that is the way to reduce the edema. They don't need any diuretic. Uh, and I, I, with my communication with most, most primary care attendings or um, faculty, uh, they agree with it because they are also at a loss of what to do. And they're actually very thankful when you start treating with external compression. Right. Um, Lisa Gould mentions that lymphedema literature by someone named Stan Roxon is high quality and very useful. And the lymphedema network is a tremendous resource for patients and practitioners. Uh, next Great question point. is about the itching of uh, chronic venous insufficiency. It, in as much as that's not histamine mediated, how do we treat it? 
so yes, yeah, so it's not histamine mediated and um, antihistamines will not do anything. Um, uh, sometimes, so the skin care is very, very important. Um, as we said, remove all that hyperkeratotic skin. Um, that hyperkeratosis actually is accompanied by high levels of the itch mediators. So removing that skin, um, removing oozing, which is also inflammatory to the skin and can cause itching because that, that, that fluid has inflammatory cytokines and inflammatory proteins uh, that cause itching. So treating the edema, treating the skin, reducing the inflammation will help. Um, and sometimes uh, topical steroids uh, uh, in areas of uh, severe itch, although they say do not put a lot of steroids under compression bandages, uh, but sometimes I do mix them with um, other um, moisturizers and it does help. So that's what I've recognized, but there is no um, I don't think there is any standard treatment to just treat the itch without taking care of uh, the elements of skin care and uh, DEMA care as we provide with compression. And so treat the cause, skin. basically. Get rid of all the crud. And I'll, I'll just uh, uh, throw in that, uh, you know, we should, we should remember that the pH of the skin is closer to five or six than it is to physiologic pH. So when we're using moisturizing products, uh, it's, it's a good idea to use those products that have a pH closer to that of, of skin um, rather than uh, something with a pH of eight or uh, uh, you know, seven, seven and a half or eight, which many of them, many of them do. That is a very good point. And also just uh, sometimes easy things, very simple things like washing the leg <laughs> will help. So, uh, that's, that's my first thing that I ask. So people, patients will most commonly say, I haven't let water touch this leg for three months for fear of infection. I say, oh my God, that's where we are going to start. And they said, but my other doctor told me not to let water touch this wound. So it's a real oh, brother. <laughs> You know, the dry skin, the scaly skin, it, that's something we see in the cold weather around the ankles. And it's made me think that there's a, a circulation issue. With stasis, it's a, what I call a venous ischemia mm -hmm. that leads to hypoxia, that leads to a deterioration of the uh, sebum that's produced by the sebaceous glands. So you have dry skin, People wrap up their legs with bandages that don't allow the normal sloughing of the surface keratinocytes. And it, it, as a result, you get this accumulation of almost like a callus that is brittle and cracks and traps uh, bacteria, like you guys said. Yeah. And uh, I, the next I, do look, I, I agree with uh, Romano, what, what you said about uh, the, the steroids, even, the, even though ideally... Uh, you, you probably shouldn't use them under occlusion. I think for these really severely inflamed scaly legs, um, a, uh, a medium potency corticosteroid underneath the compression wrap for just a short period of time sometimes can really do a lot of good. All right, Greg Schultz, one of our mentors says that would topical toxicycline be effective and useful in PG due to the three effects? It's antibacterial. It's anti-inflammatory by inhibiting TNF alpha converting enzyme, and it's anti-MMPs. It sounds so, like a Romano. Early in, interesting. Uh, oh, Greg, I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad to hear you're here. Um, so I, I I did forget to say that I you know doxycycline has such a low risk profile that in uh, patients with PG. Uh, I do start them almost 100% of the time on doxycycline because of its anti-TNF, anti-MMP uh, properties, not because it's an antibiotic. But thanks, Greg, for bringing that up. Uh, Kath, you had a comment? No, I, I didn't. There is another question, though, from Louise. What's that? Over the year, uh, Louise Boudreau, over the years, I've seen these crystalline growths in patients without diagnosis of gout or arthritis, and hospitalists have resisted my request as the wound care nurse 
for uric acid levels. Are there any suggestions to support my request? Um, yeah, that happens quite often. Um, I would say that you can suggest to the patient to see a rheumatologist. Um, that would be a person who would really diagnose it, a physician who would diagnose this um, and give you support. That would be my suggestion. So if, if they're an inpatient, you uh, ask the hospitalist for a rheumatology consult. And if they're an outpatient, you just take matters into your own hands and send them off. Correct. All Thank right. You. Thank you. And I think the last uh, was a comment from Sarah Hayward saying the itching and dermatitis is addressed and reduced for her when she uses edema wear product under their short stretch bandaging. Do either of you, any of you want to make a comment about that? Does that match your experience? I have not used it, but that's a very good suggestion. I think that's the beauty of having these webinars is you always learn. Even when you present, you learn a lot. So thank you, Sarah, for this, uh, this suggestion. I will definitely try it. I have not done it. I have not either. Okay, well, we've had, a, I think that's a record for the number of questions we've actually had, a very vigorous discussion this evening. And uh, thank you to all of you, uh, Rumana, Harvey, Lee, and our audience. So I want to thank you all for attending the Chronicles of Wound Scene investigation series brought to you by the Wound Healing Society Education Committee and Wound Healing You. Uh, as a reminder, this recording will be available in your members only account on the Wound Healing You in the next few weeks. And to close, please plan on joining us for the next webinar, which will be on April the 4th, on zebras and i'm going to mess up all these terms but anyway <laughs> convert hepatitis nodular helices pseudo epithelium something hyperplasia <laughs> hypergranulation and, and hypergranulation tissue also at 6 p.m on eastern on tuesday if you've registered for this um webinar you're also registered for that one you don't have to register again um and you will get reminders so again, thank you all and thank you guys. And thank you, Lee, for stepping in and uh, doing a great <laughs> job at the last minute. You're going to become a recurring speaker if you're not get very careful. <laughs> thank you. Dot, dot, okay. dot sends her regrets. Okay. Bye now. Thank Bye you. Bye, everybody. Everybody have a great evening. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.